All right, welcome to another edition of Instant Replay presented by Cheese it It's a little different this time. We're not analyzing plays from the weekend, but we are talking with currently the general manager of Pro, Howard Webb. You know him from many years uh, in the center of the pitch and now for the last six doing his thing here in North America. But Howard, the big news this week is that you are leaving at the end of this year. The professional game match officials limited. That's a lot of words right there, a lot put together. Hiring you to keep doing your job over in England. Uh, we're sad to see you go, but uh, happy to know that we have gleaned a ton of knowledge over the years as we've done this show. Welcome to uh, Insta Replay. Thank you, Andrew. Well, first of all, my, my referees will be devastated to hear that you're not putting the usual show together going through their plays. Uh, they look forward to that every week, of course. And, and uh, so do yeah. I, but, uh, don't worry yeah. about it. We'll be back. We'll be back. Oh, this is yeah, just a special don't worry. <laughs> We don't ever skip. <laughs> you're just building building it up for next next time, the uh, the number of clips. But yeah, no. Uh, yeah, you're right. Sad, sad to be leaving. Been an unbelievably uh, enjoyable almost six years over here in the US. And uh, yeah, the calling has come from from home. It's a good opportunity for me to go back there to, uh, to where my family still are. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting over there, but a big end to the season to, to get through first. So uh, let's start with the news itself, and then we'll get to sort of a, a retrospective of the past and, and the current in MLS and for pro overall in North America. Uh, tell us about the new job. How is it different? Uh, what about that challenge attracted you other than obviously being close to family? Yeah, of course, it's a place that I know really well. Worked over there for 11 years as a Premier League referee. Before that, I'm working on the, the English Football League um, for, for several years. So uh, it's an opportunity to, uh, obviously, personally to go back back home, but also, um, you know, to be working in such a, a you know, a league, a, a place with such global high profile is is exciting as, as well. Of course, it's a new position that they've created chief refereeing officer so you, you know you're focusing it on the actual officiating on the field there'll be a uh, chief operating officer working alongside me dealing with some of the business uh things that i have to do as a combination here uh, at pro uh, it's a bigger organization than the one that i'm working for now so it appeals in many ways i can really focus on the officiating side of things there's a lot of investment going into officiating over there under something called the elite referee development plan the idea being that they're going to invest more into the officiating pathway and in the way that we've seen the level of playing over there increase with increased investment we're hoping that the same thing will happen in the the refereeing uh, space as well so uh, a lot of responsibility a lot of pressure it's a goldfish bowl for sure um but i'm looking forward to uh, testing myself over there howard I, I have to say i am i am sad to see you go i, I feel like over the past two years, I've, I've gotten the chance to get to know you and, and your insight and in helping me understand the laws of the game and, and seeing it from the referee's perspective, because it's easy to say, hey, I'm a player. I've been in the, on the pitch. This is what I see. This is what I know. But you don't necessarily hear see it or hear it from from the other side. So I, I appreciate um, all of all of that. Um, six years is a long time for you. Uh, what will stick uh, with you the most from your time in North America? And, and what are you most proud of? Um, I, I, th I think um, I think the thing that will obviously dominate my thoughts when I look back on this period was the way that we led the way with the implementation of, of video review. It was something so so new back in 2017. Nobody had done it anywhere in the world. We were the first league to go live in, in every game. I came over here initially as video review manager, and uh, and we went live in, in week 22 of, of the 2017 season, and uh, with some trepidation, we. We thought we'd, you know, we planned everything right, and we'd, we'd gone through all of the education with the clubs and the and the and the, and the media, and um, we we thought, yep, we're ready to go. But there's still that unknown. And then that first weekend, uh, and it, and we smashed it in the first weekend. You know, we had some situations that just absolutely fell right in terms of you know being the type of situations that need a VAR to rectify them on the field. One in one in Philadelphia, another one in up in Portland, uh, and it got us off to a really good start. And I think we maintained that momentum. Since then, we've not been perfect. Uh, there's been bumps in the road, but I do think we've added real value to to MLS by implementing this this system. Lots of other things on the field. I mean, I don't want to be just thinking about VAR. Good officiating starts on the field, and I think we've put a really good team in place um, to support the officials to to make sure that they're prepared for what is now a globally renowned league that's got a lot of eyes on it, a lot of talent playing in MLS, a lot of uh, you know, real importance in the in the sporting landscape here. So it needs officials of a high standard who are getting better all the time. And I think we've put some foundations in place for that, for that to happen with a young group of officials who are only going to get better as time goes by. So it occurs to me when you mentioned 2017, 
those calls, those moments, you mentioned two in particular, are obviously very fresh for you, even five years later. And we always think about, okay, well, how do different people experience the game? In your position, how do you experience an MLS match night? I mean, you have to, when there's a, a quote-unquote, as we like to say, a controversial call, I mean, those have to be very, like, high adrenaline uh, pressure situations, even from afar, as you watch the folks that you've helped train and, and are working with on a daily basis, try to execute that in the moment. Yeah, we're, we're kind of blowing every whistle with the, with the officials as they go across the line. Um, we, I try to get across as many games as I can, MLSs, it must be the biggest top league in the world. You know, we've got 28 teams at the moment and growing and and therefore 14 games in the Bundesliga. They have nine games a weekend, 10 in the Premier League. So we've got 14 to to, to have eyes across. So my if I'm at home watching, then my, my apartment's like a, a small studio. I've got lots of screens split into four so I can see as many games as I can. I'm trying to keep across what's happening. I've got a text chat going with the rest of the management group. Of course, you want to get into stadiums as well to see the officials live. But when you're there at one game, you lose sight of what's happening elsewhere. So I do tend to, to stay in the uh, in the apartment and watch as much as I can. And I'm texting people as we go, um, you know, I'm texting by you guys and uh, broadcasters just give me some insight into what's happening to assist them in telling the story uh, as well and then we're answering pull reporter questions too um and then sometimes you'll see a game that goes beautifully and other times you'll see a game that's difficult and the, the official makes a, an error or there's a review that doesn't quite come to the right outcome and one of the things we can't do is you know we can't take a, a referee off at half time or just dip them in for the last 10 minutes because you know they're new to the league like you can't do with a player you know when they cross that white line you've got to hope that they deliver in that game and you know invariably they, they do but sometimes it's uh, it's more, more challenging and then we've got to deal with the the debriefing we've got to deal with you know sharing the learning across the entire group and with that individual and uh, we have numerous evaluation process to do that uh, but they're all aimed at making them better the next time that they go out and uh, and hopefully helping me to have a more relaxing night well i, I look forward to asking you some questions uh later on but you'll be involved in the search of for your successor what does it take to be successful in this job and what challenges will the next pro gm uh be focused on most yeah i think it's all about building relationships with you know a range of 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 people, a range of groups of people, obviously with the, the match officials, they want, you want them to have, you know, belief in the direction that you're taking. They understand that you've got their back, but you'll hold them to account as well. You know, you, you need them to go out there and deliver what you're asking them to deliver in terms of the way that the game needs to be officiated uh, based on conversations that we have with a range of people here in, in MLS, you know, the club owners, the league itself, uh, understanding what, what, you know, what soccer should look like in North America and, and how the the officiate and impacts that you've got to obviously build a good relationship with your staff who are helping you do this it's massively a team effort and uh, i'm really proud of the team that we've got in place the officials have a strong union so you've got to deal with the, the match officials union as well the world represented in that respect you've got to build relationships with the media and the broadcasters with the club staff i do an awful lot of work behind the scenes liaising with head coaches with chief soccer officers uh they always get a lot of my time if they ask for feedback they get it they get it in a timely manner uh in a really i think really transparent way and i think that's the only way we can develop long-term healthy relationships so that they can understand the direction we're taking and you know where the officiating needs to get better where we're doing well and, and how they can continue to believe in our organization um and then we've got other relationships as well with you know us soccer and the canadian soccer association fifa and concacaf um and uh, and i got friends at mls who we work closely with to try to improve the uh the, the product so i think building those relationships is really important i suspect that you know my replacement will be somebody who's got gravitas in in the world game or you know at the very highest level of the domestic game at least so that um their voice carries some some weight but you just need to be a hard worker as well because it's all around you 24 7 when you're refereeing i was on the premier league for years do my game go home bit of training do some you know technical uh training sessions as well in a classroom twice or uh, try twice a month and then and then that was it and now it's just all around you every day you've got i've got uh, 27 referees to think about and uh, and uh, another 50 assistant referees and uh, they all want some of my time uh, and attention and, and that my my staff so we've got to be uh, there for them and uh, it's a it's a big job it's a it's a political job uh as, as sort of that description 
uh, shows you. And, and look, everything is at a certain level. Everything is about relationships. I want to go back to that challenge, though. Like, wh- what are the challenges that that pro is going to face? The problems that need solving, or the areas that that might need improvement? Because, as you said, everything is geared toward one direction: is is getting better. Uh, which is not to say that the referees do a bad job now, but you always want to be trying to get better. So, how can pro uh, advance that aim? Yeah, and there's an expectation that when the referee turns up on a particular day for, for a match, they're, they're perfect on that day. And also, we expect them to get better each week as well, which is quite an interesting challenge. Uh, in, in the backdrop of a league that's getting bigger, not only the league, the main league we serve, MLS, but also the you know the, the other kind of feeder leagues for us, um, in the USL and MLS Next Pro, and then also we service the, uh, the top women's league in the end of USL. Um, and they're all looking to expand. They're all looking to grow their footprint. And with that comes more games and the requirement for more, more officials. Um, and alongside all of that is a, is a refereeing world where we've got less people starting in the very first place and less people staying within refereeing for various reasons. Um, you know, and, and one of the well-documented one, ones is around the, the way that lower level officials are, are treated and how maybe you know, they, they face difficulties from behavior of coaches of parents of players um and that causes them to stop and then of course you know when you've got a smaller talent you know a smaller group of people you've got less people to choose from the quality generally you know doesn't improve that way and therefore sometimes the the reactions the negative reactions to the officials that are doing the games gets worse and more people quit so it's a bit of a vicious circle so we need to break the cycle we need to make it officiating as attractive as possible for the health of of the long term of the game um it's a really great thing to get involved in once you get hooked into it you know you you, you really want to uh to, to go as far as you possibly can you become resilient to some of the uh some of the difficulties that you face and the people that i that i employ in refereeing are passionate cares about soccer they they love the game they want to be involved in a positive way and we just need to to sort of like show to people how refereeing can be a, a great thing to, to to get involved in we'd love to see more more ex-players involved if we can uh, we've worked on it in that area um for quite some time actually it's a, it's a challenge you know, most players aren't aren't showing too much interest in getting involved we'd love to Charlie, if you fancy a go, you know, come on, come on. Yeah. Hey, I'll, I'll help break that stigma. I'll, I'll help break that stigma. Um, Charlie's doing it. He's just doing it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'll do it. I'll do it here and there maybe. Um, but I, I'm curious because I, I do know that the refs are so passionate and they care about the game. And, you know, I, I have countless conversations with, with referees before the match um, during my playing days and, and, and since, but I'm curious in terms of accountability, so a, a ref makes a poor decision. They get someone to the monitor for a VR check for a clear and obvious error, and they stick with their call. And, and you watch it back and you say, that's an error. You should have done this, 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 this. Is that an the equivalent for you to say, hey, you should be suspended for the next match or, you know, like a red card and you sit out a couple because that's like a, a – not not necessarily a punishment, but hey, because you didn't get it right, it's the next guy's turn. Or how do you handle those situations to make them improve? You're trying to help them improve, but also you're trying to be, you know, I, I guess hold them accountable so that they don't get those type of decisions wrong. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Charlie. It's probably one of the, uh, the the more difficult things to balance in, in this role that I've got. All of us who are working in professional refereeing understand that we are working in a performance industry. We we have to go out there and, and perform. And that means selecting the right decisions. It means managing the game in a way that's credible within the laws of the game, a way that's acceptable to the to the participants. And it's a it's it's a, an art in many respects, as much as it is a, a science, understanding how to how to interject yourself into the game and, and how to be selective on what you call. And uh, yeah, um, it's uh, it's an area where, you know, we, we understand as well that we're accountable. Um, so all of the officials that we employ are evaluated in numerous ways every single game. They're evaluated on that actual game by an, a match assessor. They're evaluated in their judgment on key match incidents by a, by a panel of, of our management team who, who look at each and every incident each week. And that leads to gradings that then create a, a relative ranking table of the officials. And within the collective bargaining agreement that the officials work within, there's provisions around how those gradings impact your long-term employment. But of course... We don't want people to, to go out refereeing fearful of their job. We don't want them to be fearful of making a decision. Um, it's quite a unique place where we work because unlike 
player who works for one of the 28 MLS clubs, if your face doesn't fit with a particular coach, there's some other options and some other clubs to go to. If your performance drops off, it might be that that chemistry at that club is not quite right. You can go somewhere else. You can go overseas much more easily than, than officials can. We're really the only employer in town in, uh, in officiating terms at the highest level. So, you know, we have to be respectful of that position. Uh, it's a responsibility that we have and we look at every opportunity that we can to try to, you know, develop officials. Once we've committed to them, we look at the ways we can develop them to keep them long term. But ultimately, if it's not working, then there are there are um, there are consequences for for that in the shorter term. If a situation is really egregious, if, if it's more than just a single judgment call, um, if it has significant consequences on the game, then we will remove officials from games. We assign 18 days in advance. Um, the size of the country, the, the cost of travel here, means that to assign much closer to the to the games will be quite expensive. Uh, I know when I was in England, I'd received my assignments on a Monday for the following weekend, but I usually just jumped into my car and drove two hours and I'd be at the stadium. Here we can't we can't do that. We have to jump on a plane and, and assigning four days out is is really problematic you know, in terms of travel costs. So we assign further in advance. Later in the season, we assign closer when we know what the matchups of the games are for decision day, for example. Um, and you know, so therefore removing a referee here is more, it's more difficult because the assignments have already been made than it is when you've held the assignments back and the officials don't know about them, the public doesn't know about them. But we will do it on occasions. You know, Every season, numerous times, we'll take officials out of games when they've made a, an egregious error or where they've just not followed process in the way that they are instructed to do. Um, or we might just leave them out of the following round of assignments as well and speak to them and explain to them why. It might be that they need a rest. It might be that you know we, we want to put them into a different league, different competition. So, you know, there is accountability. It's not always that obvious because, again, we don't want to, you know, publicly flog officials. We don't want to make them lacking in confidence when they go back out the next time. But for sure, we're dealing with things behind the scenes all all of the time. Uh, they understand that they need to maintain a certain level of, of performance. And then sometimes we'll put out statements. That's always a tough one for me as well. When do we acknowledge publicly an error? You know, um, we do it. Sometimes we think it's the best way to, to deal with situations. It's the best way to maintain credibility for our group. But deciding which situations are worthy of a statement and which ones aren't, it can be quite tough. And, and when we do put a statement out, you know, you'll always get fans saying, where was our statement for this? Mm -hmm. you know, yep. that type of thing. So it's, it's a bit of a, a bit of a balance in that, if I'm honest. Transparency is obviously a balance. And I think MLS has back, got people into the idea that, hey, maybe listening along would be good and say a video review situation or having refs mic'd up would be good. And you see that in rugby as well. We had a lot of people reach out and ask, you know, why isn't that happening more? Or as it pertains to the pool process, why isn't there a public forum a la press conference for referees after matches as well? When you think about those ideas, refing a, a um, you know, a, a referee up or micing a ref up or having that video review uh, dialogue something that, say, a broadcaster could pull in so anyone watching the game could listen or a press conference for referees. Are there positives of that? Is that something that referees would be open to, that you would be open to, or are there obvious drawbacks that maybe people out there who are suggesting these things aren't seeing? Oh, there's quite a few things to dig into there, uh, Andrew. So in terms of opening up access to the officials, in my experience, that would be a positive um, I know Charlie said you yeah, had interaction with officials throughout your career, both on the field, but also uh, post-career in the role that you do now. And Andrew, I know you speak to, to referees as well. I'm sure you find most of them really affable, you know, decent yes. people who are passionate about the game and more than happy to talk about it and share their experiences and, and the way that they they uh, they view their role in the game. It's, it's nearly always a positive. So the more we can do that, the, the, be the better. And we probably need to do better at that from our side as well. It's opening up. Uh, access to the officials uh, just, you know, throughout the season at different events. Um, we, we tried it a couple of years ago, as you know, in MLS's back down in Orlando, where we opened up broadcast access uh, to the, the to the comms, the communication between the ref and the VAR. Uh, and we are looking at how we can maybe make that a longer term thing, um, which will need the approval of, you know, the world's governing 
body FIFA and we're working with them and some other federations to see how we can maybe get that back uh, there's an initial pilot scheme I know MLS are really keen to make that happen as well our officials we were all surveyed before we did that down in Orlando. They were all positive about it. They said, yeah, we're happy to do that. You know, we'll back our ability to, to, to come across as competent, intelligent, and, and you know, and thoughtful people in our deliberations when we get to the screen and when we're speaking to each other. Uh, and the, the feedback was really positive around, around that. We do have this pull reporter question process. So the pull reporters are assigned each game. They can ask questions uh, about certain types of, of decisions. I, I'm a little bit torn about whether referees should need to answer questions you know, on camera or in a press conference setting post game, um, you know, they do a, most of the time the games go really well. There's no need to speak to the officials. They'll referee fantastically well, and it just goes under the radar, and nobody wants to ask them any questions about about the positive impact on the game that they have. Um, sometimes they'll call things that that you know are really would be really um, beneficial to hear an explanation. I can see why in those occasions it would help. Sometimes they just make errors, you know, and, and there's only a limited amount of time you can come on screen and say, you know, well, that was an error and this was an error and that type of thing. It's a bit less likely to happen now we've got VAI. My day, errors were part and parcel of the game and it was accepted and, and you know, you had no safety net to, to rectify them. Um, occasionally it can help. I'm just not sure that it ought to be a standing uh, piece in the match day uh, sort of like routine. A coach has to do it. I, I realise a head coach has to come out and speak, whether they win, lose or draw. But they also go out there and celebrate their wonderful victories as well with the media. They could talk about how great the team was and people sure. are in hearing that stuff. And, and we wouldn't really have that. It, it, it usually be in the context of something that's probably gone wrong. And I'm not sure that's that's healthy long term. Right. I, I completely agree. I, I guess one of my questions too is when a referee does get signaled to the monitor, in most cases, let's say 99.9%, the the referee got the decision wrong in in the, during the run of play, so they're summoned to the monitor. Now the referee doesn't necessarily have all the angles until he goes to the monitor. I feel like every single time a referee does get signaled to the monitor, that it should be corrected. How how do we get that right? Because there are some times where the referee sticks with their call, and and for whatever reason they believe that that was right, but. Ideally, you're only getting called to the monitor to fix a corrected call by by your colleagues who who have kind of judged to because no one wants to go to the monitor. I, I've talked to all the referees. They're like, I pray I don't have to get them go to the monitor because I know I, I I did a good job. But once you you do, you feel like you have to you have to swallow that ego or that pride and say I did get it wrong. How how do we make that an easier? Uh, an easier job for referees to say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to believe, I'm going to trust in my colleagues that they got this right and, and, and make the correct call. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really great sort of thing to, to explore, isn't it? In, in terms of, you know, how that impacts your psyche when you've been told by a colleague, Hey, you made an error and you're going to have to go over there and, and look at this, this error. You want to get everything right in an ideal, perfect world. There'd be no need to ever go to the screen. You get everything right on the field. Most of our training is around looking at ways of getting the on-field call correct in the first uh, first instance. You know we're working to a, a high bar threshold whereby the VARs will get involved when something is clearly wrong, not something that's pretty subjective that could go either way. So that means that the on-field officials, officials have to make the best call as well, not only the right call, but the best call. Um, if there's a, you know, a situation that's pretty subjective, in whichever way you call it, you know, might not be clearly wrong. It doesn't mean that one way is better than the other way. It just means it's subjective. And um, so we say, look, you know, get into the best position, read the game, anticipate, move early, go, go wide, create time for yourself to therefore create an angle, stay focused throughout the 90 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and therefore you'll make the, the, the best call, you make the correct call and the VAR will be able to say quite quickly, check complete those beautiful words that referees hear after they've made a decision. I can I can hear them on the comms because I listen into the games and, and when they get check complete, you can see them saying to the players, it's check complete. I, I sometimes say to them, that just means it wasn't clearly wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean it was the best call in the way that we work within VAR. It usually is the best call as, as well. But on occasions, they'll get it wrong. And then going back to that ideal perfect world, when the VAR recommends a review, it should mean, Charlie, that the referee goes to the screen and changes the call because if the VAR has identified the clear error correctly, that means it should be changed. Sometimes, though, occasionally, the VAR looking at the screens in that 
sort of like that sterile video booth world in which they work maybe hasn't quite pitched their intervention in the right place and they've seen something they've got they've got tunnel vision on a specific aspect of the play that actually in full speed in the actual context of the way the game is played the feelings of the participants of the players doesn't reach the level of for example a red card even though the VAR seen one particular aspect in slow motion sends the referee to the screen for a red card and there's nobody expecting a red card and the referee looks at it and says thank you but I'm going to keep to my decision because I don't believe this reaches the level of what you think it is and we reserve the right for the referees to maintain their own call for those occasions which should be few and far between but we accept they could happen that's why that's part of the reason why we send the referee to the screen in the first place as the final the final arbitrator on these things they're, they're making all the other decisions so we want them to make the big decision and also it gives them the right then to, to or the ability to go back and manage the player saying look i've seen it with my own eyes i'm gonna have to send you off and you know when you see it back you'll see what i've seen it's a clear red card but they also have to be prepared to accept errors that they've made an error and part of the way that we can do that is to say look guys when you're refereeing it's it's tough sometimes it's challenging and situations will be presented that are hard to read in real speed and if if we didn't make errors we wouldn't need to invest millions of dollars in var every year the best referees in the world are going to qatar in a few weeks for the world cup they've invested millions of dollars in a video review system with the best referees in the world right um, so they're going to make mistakes aren't they otherwise mm -hmm. you wouldn't need var so it's no shame to say Mia culpa, I made a mistake. Thank you for the fact we've got VAR. I'll now rectify it. And we just need to make that more, as, as acceptable as it possibly can within the, the world of, uh, of refereeing, which needs confidence. You need an ego to referee, a controlled ego to referee. And uh, we need to make sure people are open-minded when they go to the screen as much as they possibly can be. Does, does the VAR, VAR official have this, the capabilities to talk to the, the center ref before they get calls on the monitor to say, hey, I'm, I, I'm thinking this is a red card. I, I, it seems like a tough challenge. It was a little bit high, but what did you see before I sent you that monitor? Just so I save you that trip. We had this dialogue and that if it was addressed in that conversation, now I don't have to send you to the monitor because it is pretty subjective, but I just want to get your take on it first. Does that conversation happen before they get to the monitor? It, it does. It does. We, we, okay. we, we, we don't always want them. So we'll, we'll get the VARs to sometimes ask the referee, what, what did you see? And then if they give an answer that then, sort of like gives the VAR the confidence that this is not a clear error because what is seen is is what I can also see on the screen, then that could save an unnecessary review. Right. Okay. Um, but we're also saying to the VARs, look, also read the pictures for yourself. And if you look at that and if you think to yourself, I would send the player off based on the image that I've got, we're now saying for red cards, send the referee to the screen so that the referee's got the same opportunity as you've had to look at the angles and make that decision. Mm. The referee might disagree. The referee might look at something and say, actually, you know, you've got that opinion. I've got a different one. I'm refereeing the game. I've got the feel for the game here. I'm going to stick to my yellow card. I think that's okay. I don't think, um, you know, people are too worried about those occasions where the referee goes to the screen and decides to keep their decision, as long as it's within the bounds of acceptability, the final decision. Uh, I know you're thinking about one that happened last week where the referee kept the decision and should have changed it. Um, that can sometimes happen as well, but it shouldn't happen often because you know when it's a clear error we expect that to be changed and there were some other reasons why that decision was kept i think around the technology not quite working uh so we're talking really about consistency ultimately here and i guess i would ask you how difficult it is to actually get to the level of consistency that we all want in particular when you do have these are individuals you know refereeing video assistant refereeing games and on down there are limitations as far as technology sometimes a lot of people like this idea, and I've seen it in other sports, of like a centralized spot. And obviously all the VARs are now in Atlanta. But almost like – it almost is like a Politburo, or it's like one person. And that can be consistent because of the same people over and over and over. Is that something that you're, that you're open to of having like, okay, well, every VAR decision actually goes into this centralized hub, or does it need to be individuals on each given game? At the moment, FIFA insists that it's an individual on each game. It's another match official uh, assigned to the game, just like the referee on the field, just like the assistants on the field, and they're the person responsible for making the the, uh, the video decisions, supported by an AVAR, an assistant video assistant referee. Um, and you're right, we do we do work out of a central location at the moment, so we have the added benefits of being able to brief the VARs. Before the, before the game, debrief them afterwards. They can share their experiences in that venue. We can use a smaller pool of officials as well because we can double up uh, uh, you know, across a weekend. Um, so that's beneficial too. 
But at the moment, we don't have, I know some of the major US sports have different processes where maybe one individual or maybe a couple of management uh, personnel make decisions across a range of games. At the moment, we're not in that space in, in soccer. You know, the, the idea being that officials are assigned to a game just like the on-field officials and they make they make decisions. But consistency is important. I, I, I've heard that from the day I started back in uh, 1989. It's like, we just asked you to be consistent. Um, yeah. You know, and with that drive for consistency um, is sometimes, you know, the the need to, to not use quite as much personality. Personality is wrong. You always need personality in refereeing. Personality is really important. But, oh, yeah. You know, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the greatest of all time, and uh, you know, and use a lot of personality. You'd seen fluctuate from being this really stern, strong, sort of like central focal character on the field in those big moments when he had to be, to that really soft, sort of like you know, empathetic approach. Like after the you know the final whistle of the the ninety nine Champions League final when Bayern had lost in, in the last minute, and you know, so that's some some of the skill of being an official that you need within your personality. But if you're trying to gain total consistency, you have to be careful that we don't train a group of robots. You know, uh, we don't think anybody wants robots. Um, you want consistency. Um, but consistency is hard to achieve in, in refereeing. You know, if you just look at the, the, the biggest area of sort of like subjectivity of all would still be handball. And uh, determining what is and what isn't handball in a consistent way is really difficult in a world where everything's slightly different. Every situation has a slightly different dynamic, you know, how far the ball has travelled and where it's happening on the penalty. Is it a shot and goal? Is it is it a cross? Is the player jumping or is he running or is he moving? What, what's he, what's the player doing at that moment and how is that impacting his arms? And, you know, we, we, we see situations where balls are blocked by extended arms, but then the question is, is that natural or not? And if we start to try to put things into boxes that fit every situation, then we're taking away some of the ability of the referee to use their own sort of like interpretation of what's happening and that's not also a great place to be so it's a it's one of the big challenges you know getting consistency without you know without taking away the the ability for referees to to use discretion and the laws are subjective and there's so much gray area and we feel that every single week as we argue about calls and identify calls and go back and forth and have our opinions change as we're watching as many times as we can and the other point i would make is that games are not consistent you know, it's games are different, players are different, situations, you know, sort of the emotionality of the game uh, back and forth. It, it all changes in any given moment, and that's what referees have to be able to control. Let's go back to handball. We have questions from people on Twitter. Mm. What is a handball is one of them. Uh, what is a defender supposed to do with his arms while jumping and still be considered to have them in a natural position? This whole unnatural position is sort of the crux of the law now, right? Because you're not given that leeway that you know previous iterations might have given about a deflection or about – you know, distance to react. It's you are taking a risk by putting your arm in a natural position. If the ball hits your arm, you accepted that risk. It is a handball. When you think about the idea of an unnatural position, how do you train that? How do you talk about that? What does that mean? Yeah, we, we do a lot of work around handball, around trying to be consistent with handball, around having a similar interpretation because going back to that consistency issue, you know, the game deserves that. Um, but we also understand it needs a bit of interpretation for each and every situation, as we've talked about. Um, I know there was a situation uh, with Seattle against LA Galaxy last week. It was very similar to one we saw in the Premier League. I think it was involving uh, was it Aston Villa, maybe, and Crystal Palace, I think, you know, where a guy's gone to jump for the ball and it's hit the arm, which is away from the body, and it's blocked the ball going towards goal, in, in our circumstance, at least, uh, in, in the Galaxy-Seattle game. Um uh, we, we want to take a common sense approach to the game. We don't want players to not be able to do their job uh, as a defender. You're going to jump for the ball, and that means your arm is going to come away from your body. You know, you're not going to be able to jump with the arms by your side. If your arm is egregiously away, and we think that's not natural, then of course you're going to be penalised. But I think there's also an expectation if a, if a player goes to jump for the ball, they're doing that to head the ball. That's their intention. That's why their arms are coming away because their intention is to head the ball. If they don't head the ball, and an opponent does, and that arm position blocks the ball going towards goal, and you fail to do what you set out to do, i.e. head the ball, and you've not headed the ball, then you're kind of taking a bit of a risk. And I think the expectation in those circumstances is that the players gained a big advantage from that and therefore should be penalised. So, yeah, again, it's just trying to understand what the game expects, sitting that within the laws of the game and looking at where the arm is. And if it's short distance and it comes in from, you know, really close, 
you know, you're not going to get penalised. But the further away the arm is, mm-hmm. even if it's in the action of jumping, and you gain that big advantage because it's created that barrier, then you'll get you'll get penalised. But it needs some interpretation. If you manage to get your head to the ball and you head it onto your arm, you're not going to get penalised because you've managed to head the ball. So, yeah, lots going off. And, and you look at something and there's a gut feeling aspect as well. You, you look at it and think, yeah, that arm is away from the body. The gut feeling I'm getting here is that that has to be a handball because the, you know, the circumstances are such that the arm is away from the body. I feel it's unnatural enough. He's not head of the ball, even though he was trying to. And there's an advantage being gained. And all of those things will come into the uh, the equation. Th- there's only really you know three ways you can be penalised for handball. That's deliberate handball where the arm moves to the ball. And we don't see that, of- that often, but it does happen where a player will actually deliberately put the hand to the ball to stop it going past. Or where your arm is unnaturally positioned, and that's the that's the big grey zone that we've just talked about. Or when you're an attacker and the ball hits your hand, it goes into goal or hits your hand and, and you score immediately having had the ball hit your hand. They're the only three ways, but that grey zone is the big one in the middle around what is and what isn't natural. And, and, and with that as well comes in the other aspects around the consequence of that that ball striking that arm as well. There was one last week with you know with uh, Jack Elliott in yeah. Philadelphia that the, oh, ball yeah. hits the, the ball hits the He's arm. Good at that. I thought it was in the, the arms... Christmas. That was Christmas tree formation for me. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so so I I, I spoke I you know, spoke to people about that one. The arm at the at the time the arm the ball hits the arm. The arm is 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 pretty low. In another circumstance, that might just be seen as really normal. You know that position of the arm might be seen as really normal. It's, it's kind of low, slightly out, but that might be normal. You know, I, I think we've looked at that and felt that, you know, it should have been penalised because, you know, the ball comes, is there an opportunity to get the, the arm out of the way? Probably. I think the game expects handball in those circumstances. And that'll be our message going forward. We expect those sort of things to be penalised where, you know, it's a shot on goal. The arm maybe could be retracted a little bit further. Again, it's just having that feel for... For, for what's expected on the day based based on a credible application of the laws of the game. He, he's a repeat offender as well. It's not, that's not just not a one-time thing. <laughs> but for me, the, the handball calls are, are pretty relatively easy to get. For you, what is the toughest call to make in the game right now? Uh, I, mean, I guess the toughest calls, in terms of the interpretation that we have to make on the day, the toughest calls, I think, sit around... Um, situations where you need to get two pieces of information together so if you think we have not this year an awful lot of offside interfering with opponent calls where the player who scores not not offside but there's another player who is in an offside position and the judgment we've got to make is whether or not that that player has interfered with the ability usually the goalkeeper to play the ball the assistant referee can tell you that that player is or isn't in an offside position and then has to leave it to the referee to make a determination whether or not that player has interfered with the goalkeeper because the assistants have got a really flat view, can't see from like from behind the goal, which opens up that 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 view of how much that attacker is in the eye line of the 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 uh, the, the goalkeeper and the referee's best place to make that. But the referee is also watching things like you know was there a late foul on the player that's shooting or was there was there an arm out as the ball came through or was there something else happening? So they're difficult to to get right. You need two pieces of information. Uh, to come together to come up with the right answer um and you know you're looking at it and thinking how much of an impact has that really had so we've had a lot of those this this season and we do a lot of work around trying to be consistent looking at the proximity of the attacker to the goalkeeper proximity often equals impact so we look at uh, look at using that as a rule of thumb as well you know how close the goalkeeper is the is the attacker uh, i guess the other big decisions are always around red cards always around reducing teams to 10 men uh, and just having that, that required level of, of certainty, uh, wanting to protect the game and the players from brutality or, or excessive physical play, but also understanding that's a, a big decision and needing a level of certainty that you need to send a, send a player off. And that's always a big uh, big responsibility. I think that all the referees understand. Uh, last one for you, Howard. I know we've taken a lot of your time, but these are our, uh, our educational for moments for us. And we hope for everybody who watches the show because refereeing is, uh, I think, one of the most fascinating parts of the game and probably one of the least understood parts of the game. As well, yeah. and this is, I think, uh, and we, we see that all the time. We as see far that as the all laws the time. Go. Um, I would encourage, by the way, you to go read the IFAB laws if you don't and you watch this show. Offside lines, MLS doesn't have it. I like that. I like that gray area. I like the fact that you know we're not looking for a pixel or two. Uh, the EPL does have it now, they have the little like green zone of sort of forgivability within the model. What do you think about offside lines? Do you think assistant referees want that? 
Uh, do you think MLS should explore having that? Hmm. Great question. Um, I, I think I think that as it, as the technology evolves and we can get to a situation where we can get a, an accurate answer as quickly as possible, then it will be beneficial for the game overall. I think one of the reasons why offside lines were challenging at first is because you're not getting an immediate answer or, or a timely answer. It takes time to put those lines into, into place. The on-field decision is made. The on-field decision creates emotions from the players, from the fans. And then two minutes later, you're taking away, you're changing that decision. So the ability to celebrate that goal freely is kind of tarnished a little bit with that, that possible delay of knowing the final outcome. That said, you know, you don't want offside goals to be allowed to stand to change the, the final outcome. We hope that our process that we have in MLS does give you the ability to celebrate knowing that there's a low chance of that goal being taken away because we'll only take it away when it's clearly wrong to the naked eye. But that does create, if we've been really honest about that, it does create some dilemma for the VAR when they look at a picture and think, that player looks to me like they are probably offside. But are they are they clear and offside? Yeah. 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 Knowing yeah. what we know as well about, about camera angles and some of the distortion therein. And factoring all of that in and thinking, okay, you know, I, I can't, be, I just can't be sure. How far down that line do you need to be certain? Where you think, okay, now I feel like I have got enough evidence to step in and recommend a, a review. So it works, it works well most of the time. Most of the time it works really well. And I think most people are buying and bought into it. But I think if you've got the technology in place that can speed up the process and give you a definitive answer, and I know some of that's happening at the World Cup in Qatar where they've got this ball that, that's going to recognize through a, a a sensor in the ball it's going to be pulsing 500 times a second they're going to recognize the kick point the moment of the judgment which is important and then also they've got limb tracking technology that's going to show where the player's body parts were at any one point tied into the kick point that's going to give the officials in the booth a, a much quicker answer a much more definitive answer where you're not having to kind of drop lines from players shoulders you know it's going to be created for you and Therefore, it's it's you know the, the final outcome will be much more readily accepted. I think when we've got that level of, of technology helping us, and then some animated visuals to show the stadium audience and the broadcast audience what the outcome should be. Um, I, I think that's clearly going to be a, a, you know a, a, the way forward. And uh, at some point in MLS, we'll see that type of thing as well. We're already exploring opportunities to trial semi-automated offside line technology here but until we've got a system that we think is going to be beneficial for our game here based on you know what uh, what the public expects and, and the tools that we already have then i think you know we'll continue doing what we're doing and, and thankfully people buy into it and accept the uh, the benefits of the way that we do things right now which means that you know out of you know all the goals that scored in mls last season i think only three percent actually were taken away which is uh, which is which is good those will be cheap balls huh they're just be handing those out. <laughs> you can't, you can't it might cost more than dicks. an engagement ring. Yeah. Boy, <laughs> you yeah. better make sure that when they go in the stands, you hunt those things down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Howard Webb, GM of Pro, moving on at the end of the year, going back home to England. But, Howard, we appreciate all your time. Legend. I hope all the uh, refereeing nerds out there enjoyed this as much as we did. Thank you, Howard. Thanks for all your support, guys. And then I'll enjoy working for the rest of the of this season alongside him, keeping you straight on those decisions. <laughs> you can be a fan. Once you go over yeah, there, you can yeah. watch it as just uh, as a 100%. supporter of the show. I always will. <laughs> Thanks, guys.